Welcome back to my channel. And if you are new to this space, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, I'll be looking at the Ischiana fossa. Let's try and use this image by the side to illustrate where the Ischiana fossa is located. This is the configuration of the perineum. And we know that the perineum is further subdivided into two triangles. We have the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in dotted white. While posteriorly, we have the ana triangle. This is what is also seen to be highlighted here in dotted white. Within the central part of the posteriorly placed ana triangle is where we have the opening of the ana canal. And this is what is seen at the central part. The ischiana fossa is located on both sides of the opening of the ana canal. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in yellow. We have two ischiana fossae, we have one on this side and we have the other one on the other side. So this is what this lecture will be focusing on. We will be describing the general configuration of the ischiana fossa, the content or structures that are seen within this space and also some clinical anatomy. The ischiana fossa can also be referred to as the ischiorectal fossa. In case you come across this, this ischiana fossa are bilateral wedge-shaped spaces that are located on both sides of the ana canal. We've tried to describe this when we started this lecture. If we try to use this image here, at this region that is carved out here in black is the posteriorly placed ana triangle. We say that at the central part of this posteriorly placed HANA triangle is where we have the opening of the HANA canal. On both sides of this space is where we have the ischiana fossa. So we have two ischiana fossae. We have one on this side and we have another one on the other side. And this is what is seen to be arrowed here in blue. So we have the ischiana fossae not left open, seen to be padded up with fatty tissue. So it is not an open free space. It is seen to be embedded with fatty tissue. This ischiana fossa is also seen to be located inferior to the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. If we try to look deep into the posteriorly placed ana triangle, at this region that is harrowed here in white is where we have the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. You see that this is like a structure that is seen around the roof of this space that is referred to as the ischiana fossa. The pelvic floor, the pelvic diaphragm is also seen to extend to the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle. If you look at this anteriorly placed triangle, which we refer to as the urogenital triangle, you see that this pelvic floor, the pelvic diaphragm is also seen to extend into this region because this pelvic floor, the pelvic diaphragm is a complete diaphragm. So it is seen to limit the pelvic cavity at its inferior part. Remember in our lecture on the urogenital triangle, we described in that lecture that the urogenital triangle that is placed in the anterior part is a more complex triangle when compared with the posteriorly placed ana triangle. And we can see from this picture or image that this is so. If you look at the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle, you see that you have a number of compartments created around this space. While the posteriorly placed ana triangle is just an open space that is filled with fatty tissue. So if you look at it, this pelvic floor, the pelvic diaphragm is seen to extend also into the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle. But because we have a number of structures, you know, forming different compartments around the space, we are not able to see the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm within the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle because of the structures that are located within it. So it's good for us to note this. So you see that this ischiana fossa is seen to be positioned inferior to the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. And this is what is seen here in this image. In this posteriorly placed ana triangle, we are able to see the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm because this posteriorly placed ana triangle is less complex. So let's drive through to establish the dimension of the ischiana fossa. So in a standing position, if you take the length of the ischiana fossa, which means that you take a length that will be running from the superior pole to the inferior pole, this is about five centimeter in length. Then if you take the anterior posterior dimension, if you try to use this image down here, if you take this dimension that is highlighted here in pink, 
you see that this is where we have the anterior pole and this is where we have the posterior pole. So within this anal fossa, if you take the dimension from the anterior pole here to the posterior pole, it's also about five centimeters. Then if you take the width, which of course is also represented here in blue, the width will run from the medial pole to the lateral pole. And this is about 2.5 centimeters. And as you have this dimension on this side, you also have it on the other side. So let's drive through to establish the functions of the anal Fossa. Remember that the scleral fossa, as we described, is located at the posteriorly placed anal triangle. If you use this image here, this is where we have the central portion of the posteriorly placed anal triangle, and this is where we have the opening of the anal canal. Why on both sides we have the scleral fossa? This scleral fossa, we say that it is not an open space; it is filled up with fatty tissue, and this fatty tissue is what is seen to allow for the cushioning effect which helps to hold the organs around this region in place. So within this space, we have the fatty tissue embedded within this region. And of course, we know that at this central part, we have the anna canal. So these structures are held in place by this fatty tissue that is embedded within the ischial anna fossa. Another function that they exhibit is to support the process of defecation. We know that during defecation, the anna canal is seen to undergo some form of expansion and also relaxation. And this process, of course, needs to be controlled so as to prevent damage to the anna canal. So it helps to control this process by maintaining the process of expansion and also the process of relaxation during defecation. So let's use this slide to highlight the bandwidth of the Ischiana fossa. We'll be establishing the different structures that are seen to form the different poles of the Ischiana fossa. So anteriorly, it is formed by the posterior border of the urogenital diaphragm and also the posterior border of the perineal membrane. If you try to use this image up here, at this posterior region is where we have the posteriorly placed anal triangle. We know that the scleral fossa is located on both lateral side of the anal triangle. And this is the anterior pole. Posteriorly here behind is where we have the posterior pole. So going to the anterior pole here that is harrowed here in blue, we see that the posterior pole will be formed or will form an alignment with the posterior border of the urogenital diaphragm and also the perineal membrane. These two structures, the urogenital diaphragm and the perineal membrane, are located within the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle. So if we have these two structures located at this point, and of course their posterior border is what will be seen to form an alignment with the anterior pole of the scleral fossa. So at this region here, is where we have the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle. And within this anteriorly placed urogenital triangle, we have the urogenital diaphragm. The urogenital diaphragm is also seen to take a triangular configuration. So the posterior pole of the urogenital diaphragm at this end will be seen to align with the anterior pole of the scleral fossa. We also have the perineal membrane, which is a membrane that is seen to line the inferior border of the urogenital diaphragm. This perineal membrane is also seen to take a triangular configuration. While at this region here, yeah, the posterior end, it will be seen also to align with the anterior pole of the ischial fossa. So you see that the structures that are seen to border the ischial fossa anteriorly are the posterior borders of the structures that are located within the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle. And this is understandable. So the posterior border is formed by the sacrotuberous ligament and also the gluteus maximus. Let's also use this image to illustrate the posterior boundary of the scleral fossa. We've tried to highlight the anterior boundary here, herald in blue, posteriorly behind where we have the posterior border. You see that the structure that is seen to form this alignment is the sacrotuberous ligament. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in white. The sacrotuberous ligament, as I've always said on this channel, is for us to break down the name. The sacrotuberous ligament is seen to run from the tuberosity of the ischium, which is on this side, to the sacrum. So this ligament is seen to form the posterior border of the ischial fossa. And in addition to this, we also have the gluteus maximus. This is what is also seen to be harrowed here in yellow. So you have two structures around the posterior region of the ischial fossa. So as you have this presentation here, you also have on the other side. But we'll be focusing on just one of the fossae, which is on this side to illustrate where these borders are created. 
So we also have the lateral borders. The lateral border, of course, is at the lateral edge, and the structures that will be seen around this region is the fascia of the obliterator internus muscle, and also the ischial tuberosity. So let's try and use this lower image to illustrate the lateral borders of the Schiana fossa. This is where we have the rectum, and inferiorly, we have the Hana canal. On both sides of the Hana canal is where we have the Schiana fossa. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in dotted red. We have two Ischiana fossae as we've described. So if you look at this alignment, this is where we have the medial border. And on this side, on the lateral edges, where we have the lateral border. On the lateral border, we have the obliterator internus muscle. And this is what is harrowed at this point. It is the fascia of the obliterator internus muscle that is seen to form an alignment with the lateral border of the Schiana fossa. And this is what is highlighted here in pink. So you have the fascia of the obliterator internus muscle forming the lateral border of the Ischiana fossa. Then you also have the ischia tuberosity, and this is what is seen to be harrowed at this point. So these two structures are seen to form alignment with the lateral border of the Ischiana fossa. Then medially, the structure that we have at the upper part is the inferior fascia of the levator A9 muscle. While inferiorly, we have the fascia covering the external anal sphincter. So if you go back to this lower image, we already highlighted the structures that are located at the lateral border. So at the medial border here, this structure that is here at this point is the levator A9 muscle. This is the levator A9 muscle. So we have the inferior fascia of the levator A9 muscle also forming the medial border of the Schiana fossa, but this is seen at the upper part. Then if you go more inferiorly, you have the fascia of the external anal sphincter. And this is what is highlighted here in green. So you see that on the medial border, we have two structures. At the upper region, you have the fascia covering the levator ani muscle at its inferior border, where at the inferior region, you have the fascia of the external anal sphincter. So these two structures are seen to form an alignment with the medial border of the Ischiana fossa. If you know the structures that are located around this space, it will be easy for you to establish the different structures that will be forming the borders of the Ischiana fossa. So this is what we've tried to highlight here using this image. Then going further on the boundaries, the roof, the roof would definitely be formed by the inferior fascia of the levator A9 muscle. So if you try to use this image up here, this is where we have the posteriorly placed anal triangle. So if you look to the roof, you see that the structure that you have is the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. And this is structurally made up of the levator ani muscle. So this levator ani muscle, you have the inferior fascia of this muscle, then forming the roof of the Ischiana fossa, and this is understandable. Then going to the base, the base is like the covering of the Ischiana fossa on the half side. And this region is formed by the skin that is lining over the anal region. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here at this point. So you have the skin lining over the anal region, forming the base of this anal fossa. Then if you try to use this lower image here, this is where we say we have this anal fossa. And at this inferior part here that is highlighted here in dotted yellow is where we have the base. And of course, the base is seen to be formed by the skin that is lining over the anal region. Then going to the apex. The apex, because we say it is a wedge-shaped space, it is going to be seen to have an apex. And the apex is directed superior laterally. So it goes this way. It is superiorly placed and, of course, directed towards the lateral pole. It is formed at the junction where the fascia of the obliterator internus muscle meets with the fascia lining the pelvic diaphragm. So if we try to use this lower image here, this region that is carved out here in red is where we have the Ischiana fossa. So we have this region that is harrowed here in blue as the apex of the Ischiana fossa. This apex we say is directed superiorly and also laterally. So this is how the apex of the Ischiana fossa is directed. So the structures that you see around this space is formed at the region where the fascia of the obliterator internus muscle meets with the fascia lining 
the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. We tend to use this for the side. We already highlighted in our previous slide. We said that on the lateral border here, what we have is the obliterator internus muscle. And at this point here, we have the fascia covering the obliterator internus muscle here, highlighted in pink. And we also have the fascia covering the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm here. So at this point here, that is harrowed in blue, where we have the apex of the ischial fossa, it's where we have the union of the fascia of both the obliterator internus muscle and also the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. So at this point is where they unite and the region where we have the apex of the ischial fossa. So it's good for us to be able to explain and also illustrate this. So we can see that the apex is formed where the roof and also the lateral wall also meets because the roof is also formed by the fascia covering the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. So at this point where they unite is where you have the formation of the apex of the ischial anna fossa. Let's take note of this, that there is a communication between the right and the left ischial anna fossa. This fossa here can communicate with each other behind the anna canal. And what this means is that there is a link for possible transmission of infection across these two fossae because of the linkage that occur around this posterior region. So they tend to communicate with each other and this communication also can allow for infection to move from one end to the other. So let's look at how the ischial fossa is subdivided. There is a form of subdivision within the ischial fossa itself. So let's try and drive through this slide to establish that. So if you use this hopper I made, this will have this anal fossa that is carved out here in red. So this fossa is further subdivided into two by a septum. The perianal fascia is seen to act as a septum that will be used to further subdivide the ischial fossa into its subdivisions. So you have this the perianal fascia extending from the Iltis white line of the ana canal to the pudenda canal. So medially here around this region, you have the Iltis white line here demarcated in dotted blue. This Iltis white line is seen at the lower region of the ana canal. This is around the medial side. Then on the lateral side, you have the pudenda canal here that is highlighted here in blue. So you have an imaginary line that is created by the perianal fascia. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in green. And you see it extending medially from the Iltis white line, then running laterally to where we have the Pudenda canal. And at this alignment, you see this perianal fascia acting as a septum that would then further subdivide the ischial fossa into a superiorly placed ischial fossa proper and an inferiorly placed subcutaneous perianal space. You can see that the ischial fossa now is further subdivided into two subdivisions, where you have the superiorly placed ischial fossa proper above, and inferiorly here you have the smaller subcutaneous perianal space. So let's try and drive more on the Iltis white line. We've tried to describe the Iltis white line in a lecture on the Anna Canal. If you've not checked that lecture, or oh, please kindly go and do so you will be able to understand how the Iltis white line is presented. If you look at this lower image, this is where we have the Anna Canal at this point. And we know that the Anna Canal is surrounded at its superior to third by the internal Anna Sphincter. This is the internal Anna Sphincter here. It's surrounding the Anna Canal at its superior to third. While we have the external Anna Sphincter surrounding the Anna Canal at its external part, but it is limited to just the inferior to third. So if you look at this on the outside, we have the external Anna Sphincter, and this is what is seen to be harrowed here at this point. This external Anna Sphincter is like a three in one muzzle. So you have three subunits of the external Anna Sphincter, and they are seen to form a alignment with the external region of the anna canal and you see them surrounding the anna canal at its inferior to third. So this is how we have the presentation of both the internal anna sphincter and the external anna sphincter. The internal anna sphincter is seen as a single muscle, while the external anna sphincter is seen as a subset of three muscles. You have the subcutaneous subunit which is 
closer to the skin, and that is why it is so referred to as subcutaneous. Then this is followed with the superficial subunit. Then finally, we have the deep subunit of the external anal sphincter. So this is how the orientation of the external anal sphincter is created. So you have it at this point. Then if you look at it, you have a point here at this region where the internal anal sphincter forms an intercept with the external anal sphincter. Remember that the pattern by which they surround the anal canal is different. The internal anal sphincter surrounds it at its upper two-third, while the external anal sphincter surrounds it at its lower two-third. So definitely there's going to be an overlap at a region here. And this region is referred to as the intersphincteric groove. This intersphincteric groove is where we have the emergence of the Eltin's white line. And this is what is highlighted here in blue. So you have the Eltin's white line, of course, creating a demarcation between the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter, specifically at the point where they form an intercept. If you also look deep, you also see that the Eltin's white line forms an alignment also with the subcutaneous subunit of the external anal sphincter. This is the subcutaneous subunit of the external anal sphincter. And you see that it runs, of course, forming an alignment with this subunit. So we say that we have this septum created from the Eltin's white line, which is at this level here. Then you see it running laterally to where we have the Pudenda canal, which is, of course, elected in blue in this Hawkeye image. So we have this alignment created here in green, and this is what forms the septum that further subdivides the ischioana fossa into a superiorly placed ischioana fossa proper and an inferiorly placed subcutaneous perianal space. So you see that the ischioana fossa is further subdivided into these two subdivisions. For the superiorly placed ischioana fossa proper and also the inferiorly placed subcutaneous perianal space, these two subregions are filled with fatty tissue but the structural configuration of the fatty tissue are different in these two spaces. For the ischioana fossa proper that is located above, the fatty tissue that is embedded within this region are loosely packed. And if you go back to the inferiorly placed subcutaneous perianal space, the fatty tissue that is embedded within this region are tightly packed. And what this means is that when there is infection, there's going to be the generation of an intense pain within the subcutaneous perianal space because of the pressure or, or the impact that will be created by the tightly packed fatty tissue. While in the ischioana fossa proper that is located above, the pain within this region when infection occur will not be intense because they are loosely packed. So we can try to compare and also justify why more pain will be generated at the subcutaneous perianal space during infection and why less pain will be generated within the ischioana fossa proper during infection. This can be attributed to the structural orientation of the fatty tissue that is embedded within each of these spaces. So let's go to the other features of this anaphosa that we should know as students of anatomy. There is a fascia that is referred to as the lunate fascia. This lunate fascia is the deepest fascia that is seen within the ischioana fossa. If you look at the configuration here that is highlighted here in red, this is where we have the ischioana fossa. If you look at this alignment here, this is where we have the ischioana fossa here, demarcated in dotted red. And we know that the ischioana fossa is a potential space, of course, where we have fatty tissue. And this space is seen to align with the membranes of different structures around it. At this medial region, we have the inferior fascia of the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. And this is what is elected here at this region. While at the inferior region here, we have the fascia of the external anal sphincter. We have the fascia of the obliterator internus muscle. Then also at this lateral region, we have the pudenda canal. So you can see that this space, of course, is guided by a number of fascia. But there is the deepest fascia that is seen to run, of course, covering this fatty tissue that is embedded within this ischioana fossa. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in yellow. Because this fossa is not an open space, it is seen to contain fatty tissue. So this fatty tissue has a layer that is seen to run over it before we then have another fascia on the outside, which is formed by the fascia of the surrounding structure. So this is the lunate fascia that is highlighted here in yellow. So this fascia is seen to run laterally from the pudenda canal 
This is the lateral side and this is the medial side. So this is where we have the pudenda canal here, yeah, highlighted in blue. And of course, the pudenda canal, we know it is placed on the lateral wall of the ischio anaphrosa. So you see the lunate fascia extending and of course running up, going before it is finally connected at this point with the fascia of the external anasphincter. So you see it's forming this alignment around this face. Of course, it is the deepest fascia that is seen to cover this fatty tissue. So this is what is presented around this region. And what the lunate fascia also further does is that it subdivides the ischioanaphosa into two subregions. So you have the tegmental space, and this is the tegmental space. Of course, the tegmental space is the space within the lunate fascia, where you have the suprategmental space, and this is the suprategmental space, which is the space that is located outside the lunate fascia. Then you also have the upper head here of the lunate fascia, which is referred to as the tegmentum. This is like the tip of the lunate fascia. So these are the distinct features or events that you also have around the ischioana fossa, and it is important for us to highlight this. Then let's use this slide to describe the recesses that the ischioana fossa presents. We know that the ischioana fossa is a potential space, but it is seen to have extensions into the surrounding region. So these are like out pouches. So you see out pouches created by this Kiana Fossa, seen to invade into the surrounding structure. So we have the anterior recess. The anterior recess is seen to be directed towards the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle. And you see it positioned above the deep perineal pouch. So this is where we have the anterior recess. You can see it extending like an out pouch above the deep perineal pouch. We also have a posterior recess behind. This posterior recess, you also see it like an out pouch, of course, extending towards the lesser sciatic foramen. And you see it parting below the sacrotuberous ligament. So you see that an out pouch is also created at this posterior end. Then finally, you have the horseshoe shaped posterior recess that is created around this region that is highlighted here in green. This horseshoe shaped posterior recess is a communication that is created between the two ischioana fossae. And you see it at the posterior region of the ana canal. We've tried to describe this in our previous slide. So you see that there is a communication also created at the posterior region of the anal canal. And it is through this out pouch that there is a communication created between the two ischioanal fossae. So now let's look at the content of this ischioanal fossa. By now we should know that the fatty tissue is a major structural component of the ischioanal fossa. So you have one on this side, you have the other one on the other side. We already said that this ischioanal fossa is not an open space. It is seen to be padded up with fatty tissue. And this is why it is able to provide this cushioning and also supporting effect for structures that are located around it. We also have the pudenda canal or the alcos canal. The pudenda or the alcos canal is located on the lateral side of the ischioanal fossa. And this is what is highlighted here in blue. You have one on this side, you have another one on the other side. So if we have the alcos canal or the pudenda canal, it means the structures that contain within this canal will also be taken as the content of this space. So within the halcos or the pudenda canal, we have the pudenda vessels. And this is why it is so referred to as the pudenda canal. Within the pudenda or the halcos canal, we have the internal pudenda artery. This is the internal pudenda artery here, highlighted here in red. The internal pudenda artery is a branch from the internal iliac artery. We also have the internal pudenda vein that is also highlighted here at this point. Then finally, we also have the pudenda nerve. The pudenda nerve is one of the branches from the sacral plexus. We've also tried to put up a lecture on the sacral plexus, also describing how the pudenda nerve also emerges from the sacral plexus. So we also have the pudenda nerve also located within the pudenda canal. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in white. So as you have this presentation here, you also have it on the other side. So we say we have the bulk of the structures within the ischioana fossa as the fatty tissue. Then we have the alcos or the pudenda canal located on the lateral side. It's good for us to take note of it is positioned. It is on the lateral region of this ischioana fossa. Then the vessels that are also contained within this alcos canal or the pudenda canal are also taken as its content.
And this is where we have the internal pudenda versus and also the pudenda nap. Also going further on the content, we also have additional content also located within the ischial fossa. We have the inferior rectal vessels and also the inferior rectal nerve. It is very important to highlight the inferior rectal vessels and also nerve. If you look at where we have the position of the alcohol canal at this lateral region of the ischial fossa, we say that within the pudenda canal, we have the pudenda vessels. One of the vessels that we have within this space is the internal pudenda artery. And this is what is highlighted here in red. The internal pudenda artery will give rise to the inferior rectal artery. If you look at the name of this vessel, rectal, it means it will provide oxygen and nutrients to the rectum. And the rectum, we know it is located around the central part of the posteriorly placed canal triangle, which means that for it to supply this organ, it needs to be directed transversely for it to meet the structure. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in dotted red. So you see after the emergence from the internal pudenda artery, the inferior rectal artery will be directed crossing the schiana fossa horizontally. So you see it's running transversely to meet the structures. It will be providing oxygen and nutrient from. Then you also have the inferior rectal nerve that is also elected here in white. The inferior rectal nerve is also a branch from the pudenda nerve. It's also seen to be directed also following the same course as the corresponding name artery because it is going to be supplying the structures that are located around the midline region. So you see that it is important for us to take note of the pattern by which the inferior rectal vessels and nerve run within the ischial fossa. So during the process of surgery, it is important that laceration of pods are directed towards the horizontal plane so as to prevent damage to this vessel. So this is a very important fact that we should know as students of anatomy. Then the next structure that we have crossing it anteriorly is the posterior scrotal artery or the posterior labial vessels and nerve. Also, they are emergence from branches from the pudendal vessels. From the internal pudendal artery, we have an emergence of the posterior scrotal artery or the posterior labial artery. If you look at the name of these vessels, also the scrotum and the labial structures, they are located in the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle, which means that they need to be directed anteriorly. And this is why they run through this course. So around the anterior part of this scanner force are the vessels that you would see around the space at the posterior scrotal and also the posterior labial vessels and nerve. Of course, as a result of the structures that they are providing innovations for and also providing oxygen and nutrient for, because these structures are located in the anterior part. So they need to be directed towards that region for them to be able to assess these organs. So posteriorly, the structure that you see behind are the perineal and the perforating cutaneous branches from S2 to S3. So you also have the perineal branch from S4 also around this region. So these branches are seen to be directed towards the posterior region to supply structures around this space. It's good for us to not only be able to establish the different branches that we have within the Ischiana fossa, it is more important for us to be able to establish the pattern by which they run. Let's quickly look through the clinical anatomy. We have rectal prolapse. Rectal prolapse is a displacement of the rectum, and this can occur when we have damage to the Ischiana fossa. When there is damage to the Ischiana fossa, there could be reduction in the fatty tissue that is located around the space, which means that the grade or the rate of protection will also be reduced. And this can lead to the displacement of the organs that is supposed to be providing support and also cushioning effect for. We could also have this curator abscess. This abscess can be formed from infection. And because if you remember when we tried to describe the subdivision of this Kiana fossa, we said that this Kiana fossa proper, the fatty tissue that contained within this space are not tightly packed, they are loosely packed. But because they are loosely packed, it means this abscess can allow swelling to occur because of the space that is created within this fatty tissue. It's also important for us to know that there is a communication between the two forces behind the ana canal. So there could be also the spread of infection from one ischial fossa to the other. 
We can also have the ionization of the peritoneum into the ischioana fossa. If you look at this image up here, this is where we say we have the ischioana fossa. So when you now have the peritoneum that is located or positioned within the abdominal space, ionating into this region. And this will occur when we have the hiatus of swab. The hiatus of swab will occur when we have a deficit form had this upper region. If you look at this structure that is harrowed here in blue, this is where we have the obliterator internus muscle. And on this other side here is where we have the levator ani. These two structures had this angle are supposed to lap on each other. So when you have a deficit created around this region that is highlighted here in dotted red, it means a hole will be created around this space. And if this hole is created, there is the possibility of the peritoneum invading into this deficit and of course, entering into the ischioana fossa. So when this scenario occur, as a result of the deficit that is created around this region, there's going to be the ionization of the peritoneum into the ischioana fossa due to this deficit that is referred to as the hiatus of swab. Thanks for watching this video. Let's continue to stay glued to this channel.